I'm Vincent Price. What an earthly horror did that girl gaze upon. Vincent was a presence. Three quarters of my family have fallen into madness. When he was evil, he was evil. You will each be tied in a prescribed fashion. And then, as soon as they said, cut, there was old Vincent again, you know. <laughs> I love this boy. <laughs> Vincent had great style as a person. Dance with me, Miranda. He was an intellectual. He was an art critic. The art doesn't necessarily have to be dead serious. And he had a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> Nothing can stop us now. I don't think I've ever met anybody quite as interesting as my father. The ghosts are waiting, so won't you join me? In a career spanning half a century, Vincent Price charmed audiences in period pictures and sophisticated dramas and thrilled them in the popular horror films which made him America's most beloved master of the macabre. But off camera, Price was the antithesis of his spooky European image. A witty, down-to-earth Midwesterner, he delighted in a wide variety of interests. Actor and art patron, Vincent Price, was a modern Renaissance man. Vincent Leonard Price, Jr. was born in St. Louis, Missouri on May 27, 1911, into a prosperous, community-oriented family. His father, Vincent Price, Sr., was the president of the National Candy Company and a prominent member of the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce. Mother Marguerite was a strong-willed woman who taught at the progressive elementary school she herself had helped to establish. Like his older brother and sisters, Vincent displayed an early appreciation of music and drama, and at four years old made a memorable theatrical debut as a water sprite in a playlet put on by neighborhood children. But it was the fantastic villains he saw in such popular silent horror films as De Golem and John Barrymore's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that captured his imagination. He was so excited by this movie that he came home and spent hours in front of the mirror making up as best he could to emulate this awful characterization that uh, John Barrymore had done. Also capturing young Vincent's imagination was a growing interest in fine art the precocious 12-year-old began his own collection in 1923, purchasing an original Rembrandt etching for the princely sum of $37.50. And he put $5 down and paid off the rest on a weekly basis for months, which he said created outrageous deprivation for a 12-year-old boy. By his junior year of high school, Vincent Price had matured into a handsome and gregarious young man. A less than dedicated student, he was eager to explore the world beyond his hometown. St. Louis was a very international city. At the time that he was born, it was the fourth largest city in the United States. There were uh, Italians, French, uh, there was a big German population, and so it, it created in him this sort of interest and fascination with things foreign, and he had this fixation um, from the time he was oh, in his early teens, to go to Europe by himself. And so he just had this desire to go places. That summer, the 17-year-old set off for Europe on a tour of the major capitals. As he marveled at the masterpieces in the great museums of Paris, Rome, and Madrid, art appreciation became a passion. In the fall of 1929, Vincent entered Yale, the alma mater of his father and brother. An English major, he also relished courses in art history and sang with the Yale Glee Club. I think a lot of time, too, was spent horsing around and having a, a good old time with his buddies. Always a ham, Price often starred in his classmates' amateur movies. Despite an Ivy League degree, jobs were hard to come by when Price graduated from Yale in 1933 during the Depression. 
He accepted a teaching position at Riverdale School on the Hudson in New York, but after a year, elected to further his own studies at the prestigious Courtauld Institute in London. While working on his master's thesis, Price fell in love with the theater, seeing John Gielgud's acclaimed Hamlet nearly a dozen times. That inspiration led him to pursue a secret dream. There was a private theater club in London called The Gate, and they were doing a play called Chicago, which was sort of a gangster kind of thing. So somebody said, oh, why don't you try out? You'd be perfect. You're an American. And um, he got the part because he could walk and chew gum at the same time, because gum was sort of a new thing in London. Academia would be replaced once and for all when he landed the male lead in The Gate's next production. Victoria Regina depicted the story of Queen Victoria's long reign and enduring romance with her German cousin Albert of Saxe-Coburg. At six foot four inches tall with wavy blonde hair, Vincent was the image of the handsome prince consort. When the production was brought to America a few months later as a showcase for Broadway's own queen, Helen Hayes, Price came with it. Victoria Regina opened in New York at the Broadhurst Theater on December 26th, 1935. It was unheard of. Victoria Regina made the cover of Time magazine, and Price was, in his words, catapulted to stardom when he was only 24 years old and had basically no acting experience whatsoever. He was on Broadway opposite the most famous actress of the time. And I think he pinched himself every night. His parents certainly did. His mother was thrilled. She could hardly believe it. You know, her son had ended up an actor on Broadway. They made scrapbooks for him. They followed his every move. They subscribed to Stage Magazine so they could keep up with you know, what was going on. For two years, Price honed his acting skills in Victoria Regina. But when the play went on tour, Vincent stayed in New York. Attracted by an offer from 22-year-old actor and director Orson Welles, Price joined the fledgling Mercury Theatre Company. It was a coup for the Mercury to get an actor who had scored such an enormous success. Well, we welcomed Vincent in Schumacher's Holiday, which required him to wear a, a period costume of Elizabethan nature, particularly a pair of tights. And Vinnie had very long legs, which combined with uh, cod pieces, which served to increase our matinee business enormously. One of Price's Mercury Theatre leading ladies was herself a stage star, descended from a great American thespian family. Edith Barrett had played Price's lover in summer stock in 1936, and their real-life romance culminated in a society wedding on April 23, 1938. She was really what he thought of as an actress. That he thought they would be this great theatrical couple, this Lunt and Fontan kind of couple. Hollywood had been beckoning ever since Price took Broadway by storm. And that year, the actor signed a contract with Universal Pictures. He loved the Hollywood thing. You know, he was a starstruck guy. So there he was going to a potluck at Joan Crawford's house, and he was meeting all these glamorous people. He loved that aspect of it. Price made his film debut opposite popular leading lady Constance Bennett in the screwball comedy Service Deluxe. Oh, excuse me. Say, what's the big idea? Were you talking to me? Look. Just look, that's all I want you to do. Is that your hat? That was my hat. You knocked it off with that thing. Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh. Well, I guess there's only one thing for me to do. Well, that's a great help. But doesn't it make us even? Even? Mine was an original Lily Lachey from Paris. Well, mine was an original Nobby shop from Schenectady. Oh. Public and critics alike hailed Vincent Price as the screen's newest matinee idol, and he was immediately cast in four more films. But despite positive reviews, the 28-year-old actor was dissatisfied with the one-dimensional parts Universal handed him. In 1940, Price left the studio and signed a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox. He was cast in small but rewarding roles in two period pictures, Brigham Young and Hudson's Bay. He will lead my people, even as Moses led the children of Israel, across the wilderness. Oh, Lord, my 
However, however, he took the law into his own hands. He administered the sentence of death to one of my loyal subjects, and he shall be hanged for it. The very idea, going around shooting my subjects, and without my consent. The actor's personal life received a boost in August of that year, when his son, Vincent Barrett Price, was born. Vincent Price adored being a parent. He doted on the boy. And something very special that they shared were visits to the amusement park. Price, of course, was just a big kid himself, and they'd get their handwriting analyzed and their weights guessed and eat cotton candy and go on what Price called the roller coaster. And it was a very special father-son thing to him. Just as he was becoming an important member of Fox's roster, Price took a huge professional gamble. A clause in his film contract permitted him to take time off for stage work, and he returned to Broadway for the starring role as a suave murderer in the psychological thriller Angel Street. It was December 1941. But as Angel Street opened on the Great White Way, the Japanese Imperial Air Force decimated the American Navy at Pearl Harbor. Amid the real-life horrors of World War, the 30-year-old Price created a character who echoed the fascist leaders, a charismatic, clever man of murderous self-confidence. The play was a huge hit. Audiences actually hissed at Price. The actor loved it. And Price said he had found his niche. For the first time, Price understood this curious, compelling attraction of evil. He had a real affinity to get at the heart of that psychological aspect of the character and make it believable, make it appealing, make it irresistible. Price truly had found his niche as an actor. When he returned to Hollywood after a year in Angel Street, that irresistible air of wickedness would cling to him forever. I am a stranger here. I'm not like these thousands of souls. Fresh from his success on Broadway, 31-year-old Vincent Price returned to Hollywood for his first truly complex film role, the skeptical imperial prosecutor in 20th Century Fox's The Song of Bernadette. Put your hand in mine and promise me that you will not go to the grotto again. That I cannot promise, monsieur. Let me remind you that I am the Imperial Prosecutor. I know, monsieur. You told me that before. Now listen carefully, Bernadette. In the next room is Jacome. He is cruel and mean. If you refuse me, I will be forced to turn you over to him. I can promise you it will be horrible. He will have you cringing and crying in no time. Over the next few years, Fox kept Price busy, casting him in diverse character roles in a series of high-profile films. I loved you, and I'm still in love with you. That's a tribute. And I always will be. Remember that. Is that a threat? But I must tell you frankly, Francis, that on our charts at headquarters, I'm sorry to say that your convert rate is the lowest. I suppose missionaries differ in their individual capabilities. Oh, surely no one doubts your capabilities, Francis. It's just in the way you do things. I have got to tell you, I also read palms. I cook, I swallow swords, I mend my own socks, and never eat garlic or onions. What more can you want of a man? Co-starring Gene Tierney and Dana Andrews, the murder mystery Laura would become a film classic and one of Price's personal favorites. I remember kneeling on the floor, feeling her heart. My first instinct was to call the police. Why didn't you? I don't know. Or rather, I was afraid, not only for myself, but for Laura. But it was the dark and seductive villain Price played in the 1946 gothic thriller Dragonwick that began to establish the actor's sinister screen persona. Shall I tell you what you want to know? Brace yourself. Prepare to have your God-fearing, farm-bred, prayer-fattened morality shaken to its core. See, I have become what is vulgarly known as a drug addict. Price received top billing in his next film, Shock. I could give her insulin shock treatment. Shock treatment's indicated in a case like hers. I could give her four injections. 
Although produced as a B movie, Shock was so successful it was elevated to A houses, proving the actor could carry a picture. But as Vincent's career shifted into high gear, his marriage to Edith seemed to go off track. They both went out to Hollywood. His career skyrocketed. Hers did not do as well. There were other strains on the marriage, and it fell apart. In 1948, after 10 years of marriage, Vincent and Edith were divorced. Price's divorce from Edith Barrett was a very difficult one. He was especially unhappy about the fact that he wasn't permitted to see his son very much because the boy, who was only eight at the time, went to live with his mother. But the attractive 38-year-old actor didn't remain single for long. In October of 1949, Price announced publicly that he had been married for more than a month. His second wife was accomplished stage and film costume designer Mary Grant. Mary complimented Vincent, and Vincent complimented Mary because they were both involved in art. Mary was, to look at her, very prim and very proper, but underneath she had a wicked sense of humor. And it was a wonderful, I think, changing point for him because he'd been married to um, Edie, and Edie and he had not traveled very much. And all of a sudden he found that he was with this woman who had the same amount of curiosity as he did. Mary and Vincent's Benedict Canyon home soon became a showcase for their eclectic collection of both modern and primitive art. Vincent's house was a very joyous place, and it was full of abstract art, uh, abstract expressionists, and action painters. I saw my first friends Klein, my first Jackson Pollock. It just tore my head off, abstract art hadn't gotten to museums yet, so it was just, uh, if you were lucky enough to see a collector like Vincent, you would see it. By the early 1950s, Price was not only a well-established character actor, he was becoming equally famous for his knowledge of art. The $64,000 Challenge! In a few years, he would even appear as a contestant on the popular television quiz show, The $64,000 Challenge. All right, you're the challenger, Vincent. You go first. This is great art and artists. This is $1,000, Vincent. What great artist designed the incomparable bell tower in Florence in 1334? Giotto. Giotto is right, for $1,000. Millions of viewers tuned in each Sunday. As my mom says, it was like you were a basketball star. It was like you were Michael Jordan during the NBA Finals walking down the street. My dad always felt that the best thing about that was that he would get letters from museum directors saying, since you've started doing this show, museum attendance has doubled, and he would promote the arts. Following the example of civic responsibility set by his parents, in 1951, Price accepted an invitation from the students of East Los Angeles College to lecture on the aesthetic responsibilities of the citizen. He was so impressed by the spirit of the largely Hispanic student body that he donated 90 pieces of his art collection to the college, along with the monies to support it. Price had left 20th Century Fox when his contract expired and began to take advantage of his freelance status, expanding his repertoire beyond suave, sophisticated bad guys. He showed a flair for comedy in Champagne for Caesar, a spoof on TV quiz shows which foreshadowed his own game show experience. If we take Mr. Bottomley off the show, the people who listen to our show wouldn't like the idea. If they don't like the idea, they won't listen to our show. If they don't listen to our show, our sales will drop to nothing and we will lose money! I hope I didn't upset you, my dear. Price also co-starred with the beautiful Jane Russell in two popular films, His Kind of Woman and The Las Vegas Story. They would become lifelong friends. What a beautiful picture. Moonlight, sagebrush, and my wife with a stranger. An old friend. Ah, the desert is giving up its secrets. Lloyd, this is Lieutenant Andrews of the Sheriff's Office. We'd seen him in all these very sophisticated parts. So that's what you expected. And instead of this, out comes this absolutely hysterical, funny man. He was sarcastic and brittle and wonderful. But it was another thriller that struck a chord with audiences. Filmed in 1953 in the new 3D process, House of Wax was a spine-tingling success, 
and sparked a new interest in the horror film genre. Price had a field day as a demented sculptor who dips his victims in boiling wax to create lifelike additions to his museum. Over the next five years, the multi-talented actor appeared in such films as the tongue-in-cheek Son of Sinbad and Cecil B. DeMille's epic The Ten Commandments. But he couldn't escape audiences' enthusiasm for the horror pictures. Will everyone in the theater hold on family to his seat, please? In 1958, Price co-starred in The Fly as the brother of an unlucky scientist whose experiments in matter transference mix his atoms with those of a common housefly. It would be unfair at this time to show you any more of what went on in that laboratory where a man actually dared to play God. You saw the fly? Where? It's in a lamp. Spider's going to get it. By the bench, in the garden. You're sure? Oh, yes. The terrorizing trend continued when the director, William Castle, cast Price in back-to-back -back chillers. I'm Vincent Price, and you're invited to my party in the house on Haunted Hill, where so far the ghosts have murdered only seven people. So won't you come and make it eight? You'll see human heads without bodies. Oh. Are you ready, dear? Yes, damn you. Castle's films utilized a showman's gimmicks to surprise and shock the audience. I'm William Castle, and I feel obligated to warn you about the next attraction you will see at this theater. The picture is The Ting, which I direct. And for the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. You will feel some of the physical reactions the shocking sensations experienced by the actors on the screen. Audiences loved being scared by him, and soon the likable and urbane Vincent Price was being celebrated as the heir apparent to legendary screen monsters Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. At the age of 49, Vincent Price's career was about to take a horrific new turn. In January of 1960, Vincent Price began an association with American International Pictures, a low-budget, independent film company which specialized in drive-in date movies made to appeal directly to hip teenagers. One of AIP's most imaginative and practical filmmakers was a young director named Roger Corman. Corman wanted to dramatize the stories and poems of Edgar Allan Poe and found in Vincent Price the perfect lead for his first adaptation, House of Usher. The history of the Ushers is a history of savage degradations. First in England, then in a New England. And always in this house. He had an aura, as it were, of being a gentleman and of being highly intelligent and sensitive, which were the qualities I was looking for. You buried your own sister alive? I did. But she's dead now. Just as Sigmund Freud, a little later in the century, was working on a scientific basis towards the concept of the unconscious, I thought Poe, as an artist, was doing the same thing, writing horror films from the standpoint of the unconscious mind. And I thought Vincent was able to understand that and to portray that. I'm going to torture you, Isabella. I'm going to make you suffer for your faithlessness to me. Vincent Price was the perfect embodiment of the Edgar Allan Poe anti-hero. Physically, his, his presence, his mellifluous voice, his fine features, 
were just eminently suited for period costume pictures. He really, really was in his element. Do you know where you are, Bartholomew? You are about to enter hell. Despite being B-movies, House of Usher and Pit and the Pendulum were surprise hits, scoring with critics and public alike. For Price, the Poe films provided steady employment at a time when mainstream films were dominated by a new generation of method-trained actors. The business was changing. All the independent companies were coming along. The studios were falling down. And I think Vinnie just decided he was going to have some more fun and do some mysteries. Anything to keep busy. But he was having a ball. In 1963, The Raven gave some of the screen's scariest bogeymen the chance to trade chills for laughs. Vincent joined old friends Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff in the tongue-in-cheek comedy loosely based on Poe's famous poem. Now, what is it you need? You got some dried blood off a bat in the house? Also co-starring was British actress Hazel Court. Your hands are so cold. When Vincent was working, he was serious, but it would flip to the other side very quickly, and there would be a joke or a, a giggle. The seven-picture Poe series would end with two of the most popular, The Mask of the Red Death and The Tomb of Legia, both of which were filmed in England. Working steadily as he entered the fourth decade of his career, Price's personal life appeared to be flourishing as well. In what he jokingly termed a perfect example of planned parenthood, in 1962, Vincent Price had become a father for the second time when daughter Mary Victoria was born. Price's next challenge came from an unlikely source, Sears Roebuck and Company. In the early 1960s, Sears Roebuck approached Vincent Price, who by then, of course, had a huge reputation as an enormous proselytizer for the arts, to add a fine arts collection to Sears department stores, where you could go and buy original fine art and take it home and put it on your wall that very day. Hello. So perhaps some of you are wondering what I'm doing carrying around a stepladder. Well, let me assure you, I was hanging pictures and not people. But there may be some others of you who know that I have another interest besides movies, and that's an interest in fine art. The idea behind Sears was to bring art into people's homes. Somebody could go in and see a lithograph by Picasso or an etching by Goya and say, wow, that, that's so neat. And they could plunk down their Sears credit card and pay it off on time and they could have a Goya. Over the next decade, Vincent purchased some 55,000 pieces on behalf of Sears. Everything from Picassos to originals by young artists he himself had discovered. He even found time to antique hunt while on location. All the time he was making Mask of the Red Death, he was going to the markets, to Portobello Market, to all the galleries, and uh, he always came back laden with things. The Sears partnership wasn't the only way Price found artistic expression off screen. He was a prolific writer, and over the years he authored hundreds of newspaper columns, as well as an autobiography, several books on art, and an encyclopedia of monsters, co-written with his son, Barrett. Accomplished cooks, Vincent and Mary compiled treasuries of international recipes, as well as some of the Price family favorites. New dishes were often tried out on friends. They bought one of the first mobile homes. It was called a Clark Cortez. And they would pack in it wonderful, wonderful foods and wines, and they would take two or three people, and they would go park some beautiful place out at the beach, and they would have a beautiful supper and then come home. In the late 1960s, Price had fun spoofing his horror image as the guest star of such hit television shows as Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Isn't it time, Professor? Very nearly time. Nearly. But not quite yet. Soon? Yes, soon. Very soon. And Batman. My criminal career is 
is now extinct. Let's face it, all the cool people were doing Batman. And he understood that in order to be current, you have to be current to each new generation. He understood that it, it was sort of a campy thing, the horror thing. He had fun with it. I'm not sure he would have had that much fun if he hadn't had the art to offset it. He always had that. He always had something that he could take seriously. The Price's professional popularity and rich personal life could not offset a growing frustration with his film career. His ironclad contract with AIP required him to make films which were becoming increasingly gory and more explicit, a trend the actor deplored. Only from the pen of Edgar Allan Poe could come such an horrendous tale of terror. The Conqueror Worm, starring Vincent Price in the most diabolic role of his career. Men sometimes have strange motives for the things they do. Leave the children at home, and if you're squeamish, stay home with them. Vincent was aware of the fact that after a long and successful and varied career as a star, he had become known to the public as a star of horror films. When he really got slotted into those kind of movies, he was really afraid that he wasn't doing the kind of work as an actor that he should be doing. But it was good money, and it was a certain kind of recognition. On May 27, 1971, Vincent Price turned 60. Despite his stardom, professional frustrations were adding strain to his family life and would soon lead to an enormous personal upheaval. What lovely music for a murder or two or three. In 1971, Price traveled to London to make Dr. Fibes, and the devilishly witty comedy gave the actor the opportunity to create a monster character all his own. Nine killed you. Nine shall die. Your wife no Fibes. But you I will kill. But you can't, Doctor. I am already dead. Uh, you ready for Dr. Five. Also produced in England was Theatre of Blood, a stylish horror comedy co-starring Diana Rigg. Edward Lionheart truly believed he was the greatest actor of his time. So when these eight professional critics laughed at his work, quite insane. it hurt him so deeply, oh my God. he killed himself. <laughs> then a strange thing began to happen. One by one, the critics themselves were murdered. Featured in the all-star cast was an Australian actress named Coral Brown. She was stylish, outspoken, and talented. And she and Vincent fell madly in love. Price's highly publicized affair meant the end of his 25-year marriage to Mary Grant. Vincent never explained the end of his marriage. It just happened, and he had fallen in love with Carl. On October 24th, 1974, Vincent and Coral became man and wife and settled into a new home and a new life in Los Angeles. I loved Carl and Vincent together. It was a great tea party. They were wonderful to be with and uh, very elegant together and riddled with wit. They knew how fortunate they were to have this partnership, and they never took each other for granted. With many of his films playing frequently on television, Vincent Price could also be seen making countless guest appearances on such popular programs as The Carol Burnett Show, The Brady Bunch, The Muppet Show, and almost 900 episodes of The Hollywood Squares. If you have a little time to kill, get... Hangman! I won't! I can't play with these interruptions. He also appeared in dozens of print ads and TV commercials and lectured extensively on topics ranging from art history to poetry. Lecturing brought him in touch with young people. It kept him aware of what their concerns and issues were. And it also established him as, as a real influence on popular culture. Busy though he was, 
Vincent always found time for his daughter, Victoria. I always look forward to spending time with my dad because it was like a big adventure. What are we going to do today? My dad was a lifelong deep sea fisherman. We would just go out to Malibu and we'd go for the day. He would have this sort of Greek sailor's cap and then he would um, be sort of unshaven. And I loved how he looked because he looked sort of like the old man in the sea. But of all the actor's loves, theater remained one of the most passionate. Throughout the decade, he toured in regional productions of Damn Yankees, starred as Captain Hook in Peter Pan, and teamed with Coral and longtime friend Roddy McDowell in the classic farce, Charlie's Aunt. After the theater, we would go and have supper somewhere, where you'd walk into a restaurant, and he would sit down and talk with people. He was curious and interested in everybody. People could come up to him for an hour straight, and it never occurred to him to say no. He understood that it meant something to people, and he had this great generosity about it. It was the theater which had launched Vincent Price's career, and it was on stages all over the world that he delivered what many critics labeled his finest performance. Diversions and Delights was a one-man show based on the brilliant writings and tragic life of Oscar Wilde. After careful research and months of grueling preparation, Price opened in San Francisco in July of 1977. This was the performance that drew out of him an emotional range that nothing else ever did. Price toured as Oscar Wilde for the next five years, giving 800 performances in 300 cities, from New York to Hong Kong. The depth and subtlety that he achieved in the role were extraordinary, especially coming from an actor whose performances were often criticized uh, and enjoyed for being over the top. By the end of the decade, fans who had grown up with Price's horror films were now paying tribute to the aging icon. In 1981, a young animator named Tim Burton asked Price to record the narration for a short film he had written. Appropriately titled Vincent, it concerned a little boy who is considerate and nice, but wants to be just like Vincent Price. Vincent is nice when his aunt comes to see him, but imagines dipping her in wax for his wax museum. life that had crept through his dreams swept his mad laughter to terrified screams to escape the badness he reached for the door but fell limp and lifeless down on the floor when pop star michael jackson asked him to deliver a spooky rap for thriller the phenomenal success of the album introduced vincent price to an even younger generation of fans Price's own film output had been slowing down for some time, when in 1987, the 75-year-old actor was offered the part of an aging Russian emigre in The Wales of August. Co-starring Lillian Gish and Betty Davis, Price gave a thoughtful and restrained performance. Well, in Paris, we did sparkle for a little while and managed to nourish our dreams. But nevertheless, dear ladies, we were merely bijou. Trinkets we were but en route to extinction. But you are not extinct, Mr. Marinov? No, I am still very much here. Vincent now looked frail and was in increasingly poor health, and many of his closest friends feared his time was running out. But for Vincent, life was filled with magic, and there was still one more trick up his sleeve. There was an old man from the Cape who made himself garments of crepe. When asked, will they tear, he replied, here and there, but they keep such a beautiful shape. 1990 saw the release of Edward Scissorhands, directed by Tim Burton. I have a present for you. Starring Johnny Depp as a Frankenstein-type creature with scissors for hands, Price played the feature role of the kindly inventor. Produced by 20th Century Fox, it represented a return to the stylish films he had been known for decades earlier. But the success of the film did little to comfort the elderly actor when in May of 1991, Coral Brown, Vincent's wife of 17 years, 
died after a long battle with cancer. Vincent never left Carl when she was ill. He was there for her 24 hours a day. He saw that she had the best care. They were very, very devoted to each other. Now 80, Vincent found solace in writing his memoirs, working on a book with his daughter, Victoria, and in his continued support of the Vincent Price Gallery at East Los Angeles College. Hello, how are you? I came to see your things. Oh, so Looks glad. great. Yeah. But Vincent could not deny the ravages of old age. Increasingly bedridden and suffering from Parkinson's disease and lung cancer, he found he could no longer indulge his many interests. He didn't like that his body had betrayed him. He, he had expected the end of his life to be, you know, the time where he wouldn't have to work and where he could travel. He often said he would like to open a little antique store, sort of a junk store out by the beach. And all these sort of fantasies he'd had about the end of his life, he didn't get to fulfill. He had to have oxygen. So in between the oxygen, you could go in and talk to him. He was furious. He says, old age is ridiculous. Don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. This is awful. <laughs> and he was grumping and grinding out of the bed and screaming and hollering and being funny. On October 25, 1993, Vincent Price died at the age of 82. His ashes were scattered off the California coast of Malibu, together with his favorite gardening hat. He specifically said, I don't want them scattered off of Santa Monica Bay because it's already polluted enough as it is. He didn't want any kind of memorial at all. So we decided to instead throw a celebration of his life, and we had it at East LA. It was sort of a a positive celebration of life instead of a mourning of a passing. Um, he'd had an incredibly full life and, and that's how it should be remembered. For 55 years, Vincent Price had been a familiar face to generations of fans. Best known for his starring roles in America's favorite gothic horror pictures, he left a legacy which included 100 feature films and nearly 2,000 television appearances. But Vincent Price's professional accomplishments are no less remarkable than his personal legacy. Soon after his death, Leonard Maltin paid Price an enormous tribute. He said, other actors may have made better movies, but few lived better lives or touched so many people with their warmth and gentility. He was just a wonderful, generous man. He was absolutely delightful. I loved him. The world was his oyster. <laughs> he really, he just loved the world and being in it. I think a lot of people have very fond memories of um, sitting around and scaring themselves watching Vincent Price movies. But I think the reason that those movies worked was because always underneath that, you saw this man that was having fun. And he really had fun with his life. It was a life well lived.